Garcia. I'm the administrator with the Nevada Equal Rights Commission. And my colleague here is Stacy Pratt with the ACLU. We're going to talk about the new laws that took effect on October 1st and how we're interpreting them and what your protections are. Uh, from my perspective, I'm here because I think it's very, very important that you understand your rights and the rights of others. And I'm out in the community and talking to employers to communicate that as much as possible um, so that they know how to act in the workplace, so that your coworkers know how to act, so that you know how to act in the workplace. And also, as we'll talk about, that extends to public accommodation and housing protection as well. So, Stacy and I are going to uh, kind of go back and forth a little bit. We, we haven't presented together before. Stacy's just arrived here to Las Vegas two weeks now, so I don't know. Welcome her to Las Thank Vegas. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming and for the work you do with ACLU. Thank you. Um, so the new law took effect, new laws took effect um, October 1st of this year. Uh, you may or may not know they added protections, and the one that we're going to be focusing on today is the protection for gender identity or expression. And that's in the workplace, in public accommodation, and in housing. There were also some other protections added at the same time that I'd like you to be aware of, but we're not going to be focusing our talk today on that. Um, in housing, sexual orientation was added finally as a protection for housing discrimination. And in public accommodation, sex was also added as a protected category, with, with a few caveats, but anyway. So I wanted to talk about gender identity or expression and what it means in the law. Uh, I'm sure that everyone kind of has an idea of you know, what it means to them or what they think it means. Sometimes the law is going to interpret it a little bit differently. And just real quickly, I want to read to you the way it was written into Nevada state law. It says gender identity or expression means a gender-related identity, appearance, expression, or behavior of a person, regardless of that person's assigned sex at birth. So I read that so you can see how broadly it's defined, or you could say it's not defined at all, <laughs> pretty much. Um, from our perspective, that makes it all-encompassing. That's good. It doesn't limit to a certain type of gender identity, a certain type of expression, from our perspective, and that's, I mean, from the Equal Rights Commission as a state agency that will handle these kinds of cases, we think that it also doesn't necessarily limit to male or female. There could be an identity of neither or both. There could be an identity or expression of being androgynous. And from our perspective, that's included under this law as well as far as being protected under discrimination law. What I mean by that as well, when I say that the law protects those categories, I'm talking about from discrimination in employment, housing, or public accommodation, and discrimination in the form of harassment, mm -hmm. which is kind of a feeling. Mm -hmm. It involves name calling or epithets or slurs, you know, being excluded being treated disparately, maybe more harshly ridiculed, that kind of thing. In the workplace, that also extends to housing and public accommodation, that harassment protection. I'm also talking about having adverse actions taken in the workplace because of your gender identity or expression or any of the other categories protected under the law. And adverse actions meaning not being hired, not being promoted, being disciplined, being fired, um, anything in between, including the terms and conditions of your employment, in other words, altering how you do your job, um, giving you a duty that someone in your position normally wouldn't have, that kind of disparate treatment. So the law now protects against that kind of disparate treatment in the workplace, public accommodation and housing. And that's why we, we find this so important and why educating the public is so important. Um, because your coworkers as well need to know that this protection is in place so that they're not treading on your rights and vice versa. So we would say gender identity is an internal sense of your gender. And as I said, typically it's going to be male or female, but it's not necessarily limited to that. Gender expression, as you might expect, is 
um, your outward appearance or behaviors or mannerisms, as Jane would say, it's a way of putting yourself in the world as far as your gender. It could include clothing, hairstyle, a way of talking, a way of moving, a way of acting. Those are forms of expression, and the protection is if you're expressing your gender in one or more of those kinds of areas. So the point of the law is that you shouldn't be judged in the workplace because of how you're dressing, acting, talking, speaking, or whether you feel that you're male, female, or, or some other uh, identity. You should be judged on your merits, on your skills, your ability, your performance, as far as employment. And I'll focus on employment because it's the most of what my agency sees. We're going to talk about some of the other things because certainly public accommodation there are issues that are going to come up. Um, but it, I, I focus a little bit more on employment. So you see this has really broad coverage. Um, as far as gender expression, if you look at the way it is in the law, it says gender identity or expression. That or, as opposed to and, is very important because basically it gives you two protections. It's almost like having two separate categories and it means that they can be mutually exclusive. So that includes then if your expression is Let's say you uh, gender identify as male, but perhaps you like to express yourself as female or in female clothing on occasion. The law would say that's protected. That expression is protected because it's that broad. So is proof of your gender identity or expression required? Absolutely not. If an employer or a place of public accommodation, like a restaurant, a bar, a gym especially, if they ask you, prove it, show me your driver's license with the gender marker on it, do not have to. The law protects against that. You do not have to provide proof. And Stacy's going to talk a little bit more about those areas of the law and what she found in researching other jurisdictions that have this coverage. It's new to Nevada, but it's not new nationwide. There are, I don't know what you found, the last statistics I had as of 2009, there were 13 states, so Nevada's 14, 109 cities, and Washington, D.C. already have this type of protection. So it's not new in the country, it's new to Nevada. And we're looking to those other jurisdictions as far as how to react to the law and where we think the protections are. And as you can see, very, very broadly protected. Do you have to be living full time as the gender that you identify as? The answer is no, you don't. And especially if you're in a period of transition, perhaps you're not living as a specific gender at every moment of every day. So the law doesn't require that as well. Does the law require consistent expression? And this is something we'll banter a little um, bit about with Stacy. Do you want to talk about that yeah, section is, now? Sure. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do, you know, this is new to Nevada. So when you have a new piece of legislation that comes into play, it's very helpful to look to other jurisdictions to see how have they interpreted it, how has it worked, what hasn't worked. And one of the things I can hand out here is a number of jurisdictions have looked at the issues of gender identity and gender expression and defined them in their own way. Um, most of them are very consistent with what you've heard so far today, but some of them add additional elements. And, and this was something we actually kind of had a discussion on. Just let me know if I give you enough time to not need to be sincerely held? Does it need to be something that's part of a person's core identity and not being asserted for an improper purpose? What level of proof is required? Should proof be required? And we were very clear that proof should never be required. But at the same time, you know, is there an issue of sincerity? Is there an issue of consistency? And that, that was something we had discussed prior to this. Connecticut does require those elements. And I think it relates to situations where there was a concern. Did you want to relate that example of the employee who kind mm -hmm. of? Uh, yeah, I, 
I've been going out with Jane Heenan, who you all probably know, who's kind of organized this event. We've been doing presentations to employers about discrimination in general and especially about the new law. So just this week as we were doing a presentation, you know, one of the employees stood up and he said, you know, you know, I have a young daughter and I want to take her to the women's restroom because it's cleaner and nicer and I feel safer going in there with her. And he said, of course, everybody would have a fit if I went in there. So he said, so what you're telling me is, is if I say I gender identify as female, that I can go into that restroom now and bring my daughter. And I was, I was speechless for a moment and not knowing how to respond. And I'll say, we'll kind of give you our opinion right now, but it's not yet been determined. It may have to require some kind of challenge in court to interpret the law because the law is so broad. Um, so the idea of a sincerely held belief is not new. It's used with religious um, coverage under discrimination law. If someone has a religious belief, the law says it has to be sincerely held. And it also says that the employer can't challenge that belief. So it's kind of a similar set of circumstances as, as far as how religion is handled in discrimination law. So my opinion, and I don't know if that's your take either, is that's the direction I would like to go with it. And actually, I wanted to raise it with the community mm -hmm. and say, are there thoughts within the community about what's the best method? I mean, I, I certainly understand the desire to make sure no one's out there mocking the protections. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I don't want to enter a situation where folks even feel on any level that they have to prove who they are. That's totally inappropriate. So I don't know if folks within the community have feelings or you know, if there are others who might say, wow, I, I really want to avoid that kind of language. I think this is going to be so rare that anyone who did that, you know, they're just foolish people out there. <laughs> or you know what I mean? Like how people themselves thought about it. And I just think part of this conversation is we're trying to figure out some methodologies to make this an effective protection. And in doing that, sometimes you have to reference what's going on in other circumstances. Is there anyone here who has thoughts or would like to share? Not enough coffee yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's always my problem. <laughs> I, I would like to share a thought, if I might. Um, like, for example, public restroom mm -hmm. type scenario we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, It's not appropriate to be uh, have to prove your gender. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But is it necessarily appropriate to be accused of the opposite gender and not have repression? Like, and that would be harassment, right? Right. I mean, and that and that's what other jurisdictions have found. Um, I, I want to go into depth on the public accommodations piece and the whole restroom issue. I think that's an important one that people tend to face, and that's a big part of the case scenario we're going to discuss. Um, I didn't know, are you kind of ready for that transition? Or? I've, got, I, I've got about five more okay. minutes worth of if, stuff. If you don't well, mind holding for just one minute. Let's come back to it either way. Um, 